Hello everyone and welcome to the £1 million Supercomputer Extreme Teardown. Now before I start taking this apart, I'd like to give you a bit of history about this system. Now this is an SGI Altix 4700, which was part of a supercomputer up until 2011 when it was decommissioned. Throughout its four years of operation, it processed scientific and medical data for a British university. Now when these racks were new, they cost over a million pounds for the pair. Now each of these racks holds 64 dual-core Intel Itanium 2 processors, each running at 1.66 GHz. This puts the total processing power at just over 600 gigaflops, or 0.6 teraflops. That's 600 billion floating point calculations every second. Now it also has one terabyte of DDR2 ECC memory. It weighs just under a tonne and consumes just over 41 kilowatts full load, which is the equivalent of powering around 450 LED TVs or around 4,000 iPads. Now, each of the 128 processors cost £1,575 when they were new. That's over £200,000 just spent on the processors. And one final trivial fact. The 128 processors in this system contain over 217 billion 600 million transistors. That's enough for two transistors for every person who has ever walked on the planet Earth in all of history. Now while it's sad that such a fantastic piece of equipment is being taken apart and eventually scrapped, this system is incredibly inefficient compared to modern supercomputers. At 41 kilowatts, it would cost over £115 a day in electricity just to run this system. Now that's fine if you've got plenty of poor students' tuition fees to spend, but these days you can get much higher performance out of GPU-based systems, which is why these systems are now rendered obsolete. Now as you can see, this system is made up of these hot swappable nodes. These are easy to move, and you don't need any tools. Each node has 16 gigabytes of DDR2 ECC memory and two Itanium 2 dual core processors. Now the heat sinks on the processors and the ASIC, these are all solid copper plated with nickel. The heat sinks on the voltage regulator modules are solid blocks of aluminium. Now each node has 16 gigs of RAM, that's 8 gigs for each of the Itanium 2 processors. Now this is error correcting code RAM, which means it's able to detect and correct any data corruption, which could otherwise render a scientific calculation useless. Now I'll pop the heat sinks off so that you can get a better view of what's underneath here. Now this is what each node board looks like without the heat sinks. Each of the voltage regulator modules for the processors plug into these two 6 pin ports here. As you can see, the voltage regulator module was connected to the processor via this large pin grid array. Now the heat sink on the processor is a piece of solid copper, which is nickel plated, so I'm going to carefully remove that to expose the die. Well now that I've removed the heat spreader, you can see that the silicon die in this chip is absolutely huge. It's about an inch and a half long by about an inch high. Now this was bonded directly to the heat spreader using this metallic substance. Now at first I thought this was lead because it's very soft and malleable, but when I looked at the data sheet this process is actually ROHS compliant, which means it can't be lead, so it must be an alloy of some kind. As you can see this has got the... Uh consistency of lead or sodium. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly light as well and it's very easy to cut. Now there's a few components surrounding the die. As you can see we've got a lot of tantalum capacitors on here and we've got some on the other side there as well. Uh, these link directly into the voltage regulator module which connected on here. Now on this side we've also got uh, an analogue devices chip, this is a temperature sensor, and we've also got a couple of Atmel EEPROMs here. 
and unlike other CPUs from around 2007, the Itanium 2 doesn't use a land grid array, but instead uses the traditional pin grid array to connect into the motherboard. And just to show that I don't get it right every time, here's a processor which I tried to remove the heat spreader from, but I didn't leave it to heat up for long enough, which meant that when I took the heat spreader off, it took half the die with it. This is an incredibly thick board. It weighs over a kilogram on its own without any of the heat sinks or the processors. You can see there must be at least 20 layers there. It's heavily gold plated all around the edges and on the back as well. All the wires, all the pads, everything, it's all gold plated. Now there's nothing on the back apart from uh, a lot of passive components and there's a, an Altera Max 2 FPGA, there's a bit of flash memory there as well. But apart from that there's, there's nothing really on the back there. The main chipset is a custom ASIC known as the S-Hub. It's designed by SGI and manufactured by IBM. Each of these nodes connects into the backplane, and each backplane supports up to 10 nodes, along with the power supplies, the system control board, the Numalink 4 router board, the I.O. board, and any PCI expansion cards. Now this is the I.O. board, which contains the USB ports, the network interface, the PCI X slots, and also the DVD drive and hard drives would connect in via this connector here. Now this also has a custom ASIC on here, but this one's marked TIO 1.1. Again, manufactured by IBM, designed by SGI. Now up here we have a silicon image fibre channel controller. Next to that we've got a USB 2 controller chip there. Down here we have a dual gigabit ethernet controller and there's also an LSI logic chip there which seems to have a built-in ARM processor as well. And there's a badly damaged capacitor there. Now the two hard drives which were connected to the I.O. board are these Seagate Cheetah 15.4K RPM drives. Um, they're 146 gigs each and they seem to have SGI firmware on there as well. Now this is the system control board which has the LCD on the front, the RS-232 console port and a CAT6 Ethernet port. This board is much smaller than the others because it just provides a basic user interface on the status of the system and it allows for it to be turned on and off, along with an RS-232 console port for diagnostics and configuration. Now all of this is handled in the Altera Max 2 FPGA. There's also a network controller IC a bit of flash memory and some RAM. There's just a single ASIC here which controls the Numalink bus. The two connectors on the end, these each allow for the IRU to be daisy chained to one another and to the Numalink hub. Now as with all the boards in this system, they have these very large and very expensive Amphenol branded connectors on the ends which connects into the back plane. This is a very nicely laid out power supply. There's very little wasted space and also the design allows for the maximum airflow from the front to the back. These are the Numalink cables which connect each IRU and each node to one another and then eventually these uh, all connect up into the hub which is on top of the unit. Each of these are colour coded to indicate the length. For example, this one here is colour coded blue and it's 0.75 metres, whereas this one, which is colour coded green, is 2 metres. There's also some 3 metre cables which are yellow and they go from the bottom IRUs up to the top where the hub is. Each of these connectors are incredibly well made. These are all made from machined aluminium and there's just a small plastic clip at the top to release these from the node. I've disconnected all the cables from the Numalink hub now, so we'll get that down and we'll have a look inside that. Now this is the Numalink hub. This was on top of one of the racks, and this is where all of the Numalink cables connect into, allowing the nodes to communicate with one another. This hub has a total of 32 Numalink ports. There's 16 on the front, and there's 16 on the back. 
And underneath the heatsink is another one of these SGI Numalink controller chips. Now it looks like there's four separate boards in this Numalink hub and they're all connected by this backplane connector here. And at the end of this board is an Altera Max 2 FPGA which is probably just being used to monitor the performance of the hub. If you were wondering what's at the back of these racks, it's just an incredibly large number of fans. I can imagine those would be quite noisy when they're all running. Now it's with regret that these systems are just going to be broken up for scrap. Now there's almost no demand for spare parts for these, and even if somebody did want one of these nodes or the odd I.O. board, there's been so many of these systems decommissioned in the last five years or so that the market is saturated with them, and they aren't worth that much anyway. For this reason, every part of this system is worth more in scrap than it's worth as a spare part. The heat sinks are pure copper, the boards are covered with gold, and there's a lot of aluminium in it as well. Now even the Itanium 2 processors, which cost an eye-watering £1,575 each when new, rarely sell at all on eBay. Well thank you for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe to my channel. If there's any questions you've got about this system which I haven't answered in this video, please feel free to leave me a comment and I'll do my best to answer it.